Is the ketogenic diet the best diet out there? Do you have to be in ketosis all the time for the rest of your life? Are carbohydrates bad for your health? How can you not get sick when you do eat some carbohydrates? Welcome to the Body, Mind and Power Podcast Episode 5. These are exactly the topics that I'll be discussing in today's show. I'm going to replay you the live stream of my Facebook page where I discussed about the three stages of the ketogenic diet, what they are and why you should want to implement them into your diet we'll discuss soon. But If you want to support this podcast, then make sure you leave us a review on iTunes and other social media platforms. But my name is Seem, and let's get on with the show. Do you want to know what it is? Body, mind, empowerment. Get stronger, faster, smarter, quicker, friendlier, more helpful, more driven. Everything the body needs. Control your mind. In today's live stream, I'm going to be talking about the three stages of the ketogenic diet and what they are we'll get down to business right away you know the reason i decided to talk about this topic in particular is that you know the more i learn about ketosis and the ketogenic diet the more i'm amazed of how powerful it is for your overall health your cognition and your physical performance i think it's truly one of those optimal human diets because it not only keeps you healthy but it also puts you into this almost post-optimal state where your body can create its own fuel without calories even though i could happily eat the ketogenic diet for you know the rest of my life because i feel so amazing all the time and the foods are also so delicious i still recommend you to occasionally dip in and out of ketosis you know there are many reasons for it not because it's unhealthy that, that like keto is dangerous for you, but to simply increase your metabolic flexibility and improve the diversity in the microbiome. And you know, people do the ketogenic diet for many reasons, to lose fat, to battle diabetes, to improve their health, or to simply eat bacon or something. <laughs> but healthy people who simply want to live the keto lifestyle, they should follow certain stages on their ketosis journey. And that's why I'm going to be sharing with you the three stages of the ketogenic diet you should go through. What are the three stages of the ketogenic diet? Well, the first one is is the simplest one. The first is to get into ketosis. Stage one, getting into ketosis. Uh, the first purpose of the ketogenic diet is to maintain nutritional ketosis for at least the vast majority of time to be in this uh, fat burning state where your body burns ketones or you know it has elevated levels of ketones in the bloodstream that energy can come from either the dietary fat that you eat from food like let's say butter, eggs, fish, meat or straight from your adipose tissue when you're in a caloric deficit if you're doing keto because of diabetes then you should pay particularly close attention to this because you know these irregular ups and downs of insulin and blood sugar can make your diabetes actually much more worse that's the reason why therapeutic ketosis is so effective it allows your body to heal itself more rapidly high levels of blood sugar will elevate insulin which makes your cells more prone to insulin resistance and you you're more prone to storing the food as fat as well In some cases, long-term keto or even prolonged fasting can actually reverse insulin resistance and very much, you know, cure diabetes completely. It's even used to treat some cancers and tumors and even neurodegenerative diseases. But if you don't have any serious medical condition, then you don't need to be so strict with it all the time because your metabolism is more robust and resilient of course you can't be eating a lot of carbohydrates that would that would kick you out of ketosis but you won't have any you know severe negative consequences for your health either if you simply you know eat 10 to 20 grams of more carbohydrates if you're if you're not that keto adapted then you may feel slightly sluggish or you may feel slightly tired at day day, day times afterwards but this is just a temporary side effect of dipping in between ketosis, whatever the case may be, you should still want to first establish nutritional ketosis and maintain it if you were to go on a ketogenic diet. 
both of them as a long term and a short term thing. The first stage is when in which you're depleting your liver glycogen from glucose and teaching your body to use ketones for fuel. When your liver glycogen gets low, then the liver starts producing ketones as a new source of energy. Because your body realizes that there is not going to be no readily available fuel around in the form of glucose, it will become more self-sufficient and it starts to convert all of those triglycerides that are stored in your adipose tissue into energy. There are about 100 to 150 grams of glycogen in the liver. It usually takes about 16 to 24 hours of fasting for you to deplete your liver glycogen. Muscle glycogen stores are substantially larger as they can deposit about 300 to 500 grams of glycogen depending on how, mu how, much, how large your muscle size are. And you don't need to deplete your muscle glycogen to get into ketosis because you you only use your muscle gly you only use your muscle glycogen in very intense and strenuous physical activity you know that taxes the anaerobic respiratory system when you're doing resistance training lifting weights high intensity interval cardio sprinting or even when you're doing like steady state cardio for very long hours so getting into ketosis is going to suck in the beginning because your muscles aren't used to utilizing fat for energy yet it it has to it has to take some time. So I'm going to share with you this simple cheat sheet for getting into ketosis quite easily. And in this first stage of the ketogenic diet, you want to be strict with the foods you eat because any hiccups or hidden sugars they're going to have a much greater effect on you. First you have to keep your carbs around 20 to 30 grams net. The, the less carbohydrates you eat, the faster you can get into ketosis. This gives your liver some more chance and opportunities to be converting ketones into fuel. Secondly, in, you can be in, in a caloric deficit, but it's not that advised. It's gonna make you more tired and it may even cause some muscle loss because your body is still going through an energy crisis. So you should just eat around maintenance for a few around your maintenance calories for a few days to let your body get used to using ketones. Thirdly, you should eat enough protein and fat. You need the essential amino and fatty acids to preserve lean tissue and promote your fat burning at the same time. Ketones are actually muscle sparing, but only if you're able to utilize them. During your keto adaptation, you, you want to keep a stable intake of nutrients, but afterwards you're not that much negatively affected by fasting or caloric restriction. Caloric restriction itself is actually very ketogenic because you'll be directly converting your own body fat into fuel. And fourthly, to avoid the keto flu, you should consume more sodium. And great ways of doing though is to drink some bone broth, some bouillon cubes, and to reduce your overall stress levels because stress is directly anti-ketotic which is directly the opposite to where you want to get. Getting enough potassium and magnesium are also crucial because you may suffer some electrolyte imbalances once you stop eating carbohydrates because if you exclude the carbohydrates then you may excrete more water and this will make you flush out some of the micronutrients in your body. To prevent that, you can add some more salt to your foods, drink some mineral water and eat more nutrient-dense foods like spinach, broccoli, eggs, salmon, pumpkin seeds, sesame seeds and avocados. Those are one of the, one of the staples of my ketogenic diet at least. And you know, if you're trying to do keto then you should always try to maximize the micronutrient content of all of your foods because you know the variety in the food choices is quite limited and you know you, you want to get the most bang for your buck. The fifth point is to do less intermittent fasting. Fasting is a stressor to your body like anything else so at first when you're trying to adapt to keto then it may cause slightly too much stress for your body. You, don't f you shouldn't feel obligated to fast any longer than 16 hours when first adapting because your body isn't that used to prolonged periods of you know, avoiding food. 
your your metabolism is still geared towards burning sugar instead of fat. Once your liver glycogen stores get depleted and you're still in demand of energy, then your body will begin to search for some more glucose. You're gonna burn some fat at it, but you're not gonna do it to the your fullest potential as you can simply excrete some of the ketones through your urine without you know, putting them into use. And what's the second thing that uh, after calves that can produce glucose? Yeah, it's protein. Protein through gluconeogenesis. So what happens is that when you're in a caloric restriction or exercising on a sugar burning metabolism, then you'll start converting your muscles, your organs and your lean tissue into glucose while preserving most of your fat stores. You know, if done, if, and if you do it over a long time, then this can lead to this skinny fat syndrome when you're, you're still, you know, very skinny, you don't have a lot of muscle, but you all, at the same time, you still have some fat around your, your waistline. And when you look at, like, the average person who exercises at the gym, or who, who does a lot of cardio, then they don't look fit at all. They, they still have some fat or puffiness around their waistline. They don't have that crisp, dense look. And the reason is that they're simply burning sugar and muscle instead of fat. That's, 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 and that's also the reasons why you would want to get into ketosis as fast as possible you know, on any diet because it's going to preserve your muscle mass and it's going to directly be it's going to directly convert your fat and not your protein into into energy this brings up the question of whether or not you should fast to get into ketosis you can you can get into ketosis already by fasting for only 3 days or eating a low carbohydrate diet for about two weeks. When you're coming off a diet that doesn't restrict carbohydrate intake, then you're going to experience slightly higher rates of gluconeogenesis. And once you stop eating food, the energy it does need will be derived from your lean tissue and organs. A lot of that energy will come from your own fat, because fat can also be converted into glucose via the same process of gluconeogenesis but a significant amount of it will be still your protein being converted to glucose. If you want to get into ketosis faster with fasting, then you should deplete your liver glycogen first by eating very low carb for a few days prior to your fasting. You don't need to be consuming any more than, let's say, 100 to 150 grams of carbohydrates a day, even if you're on a regular diet, because that's the amount your liver can deposit. If you're not physically active, if you don't train a lot, then your muscle glycogen will remain quite stable. You're, you won't trigger your body to release its muscle glycogen without tapping into your anaerobic respiratory system. If you're just doing your daily activities, then you're burning primarily fat and your liver glycogen. Whatever road to take, either the three-day fasting or eating low carb for two, two weeks, it, it generally takes, it, it generally still takes about two weeks to see the first signs of being in ketosis successfully. The state of nutritional ketosis begins at 0.5 millimoles, which in blood sugar terms is about less than 80 milligrams. If you're not feeling hypoglycemic after not having eaten anything for 20 plus hours, then you're more likely burning those ketones for fuel instead of excreting them out. And this is also the point that leads us to the second stage of the ketogenic diet. The second stage of the ketogenic diet is called keto adaptation. When during the first two weeks you were trying to establish nutritional ketosis, then the second stage of the ketogenic diet is about becoming keto adapted. You might have heard about these words, you know, being thrown around by different people, but what do they actually mean? They're, they're not actually mutually inclusive, they have, they have some differences. Some people may disagree with me, but, but uh, which is fine, but what, ma what matters is that they're not the same, they're different conditions. Here's how I define these two. Being in ketosis is the actual metabolic state with the you know, appropriate levels of blood sugar and ketone bodies of 0.5 millimoles. You can be in mild ketosis already after fasting for 24 hours, but 
It doesn't mean that you're successfully using fat and ketones for fuel. Keto adaptation on the other hand is the process by which your body adapts to utilizing fat and ketones as a primary source of energy. It means that you don't need glucose to produce ATP and you can thrive on consuming dietary fat or by burning your own stored body fat for energy. Keto adaptation results from nutritional ketosis but you don't need to be in ketosis all the time to maintain keto adaptation. You have to go through a period where your liver's enzymes and your metabolic processes change so that you could have the ability to burn fat for fuel. And this takes some time. The purpose of this stage, the keto adaptation stage, is to build up your fat burning engine by continuing to eat the ketogenic diet and incorporating more exercise into your daily regimen. So how do you exercise to become keto adapted? Well, during the initial weeks of trying to get into ketosis, your, your physical performance it might suffer because you go through this small energy crisis. Intense exercise like lifting weights, sprinting or doing very intense endurance exercise for many hours will deplete your muscle glycogen. You don't need carbohydrates to replenish your muscle glycogen stores, but you may not be able to do this during the first few weeks. Afterwards, you'll be able to perform equally as good at high intensities as you would when eating carbohydrates. Low intensity aerobic activities burn exclusively fat for fuel. This is, this is the reason why the ketogenic diet is superior to everything else because if you're keto adapted then you will always have access to your own body fat and you don't need to refeed on carbohydrates or these glucose sports drinks like Gatorade or fruit or anything like that. To first become keto adapted you should focus more on low intensity activities but you should still incorporate some resistance training for the other health benefits like the increased bone density and muscle mass. Once you start feeling awesome on ketogenic diet, then, then you should also start incorporating both of these training modalities, you know, the aerobic and the anaerobic energy systems for increased mitochondrial density. What I recommend is you, you should do resistance training three to four times per week and stick to two steady state cardio sessions with one day for rest and active recovery and the active recovery day is is a simply you know a simple rest day where you go for a walk do some foam rolling or go to a sauna or have an ice bath the biggest mistake people make is at the intensity at which they do their cardio you know they think that the harder they push themselves the better they're doing <laughs> It might work in some cases, but doing cardio anaerobically for too long isn't that good for your health. This is called the black hole training. It's this nightmare exercise zone somewhere between somewhere between a piece of cake and a Navy SEAL workout. You know the pace is vigorous, but it's not painful. You're, you can enjoy it with your mind. You get this endorphin rush which makes you think that, oh, I'm getting a good workout but it's still too stressful for the body. Basically, the black hole is a heart rate zone that exceeds your aerobic capacity just a tiny bit. You know, once you can't hold a conversation anymore while you're exercising and you have to start breathing through your mouth, then you're using more glycogen and less fat for fuel. Doing this for a few minutes is fine, but mo you know, most people, they, they never go for a run for just 10 minutes, they hit the, this runner's flow and because of the adrenaline rush, they can easily empty their glycogen stores quite quickly. After that happens, the body still needs some glucose to perform at, at this intensity and because of that, it begins to break down some of its protein. Too much cardio do the wrong way can increase your stress hormone, the cortisol, which if you ele elevate it for too long, it can lead to adrenal fatigue, which is quite common among, amongst people who exercise. It can also cause systemic inflammation through gluconeogenesis, and it definitely increases oxidative stress and damage because burning carbohydrates, it causes the accumulation of advanced glycolytic end products. Doing too much cardio also will tear down your joints 
and causes pains and aches because you follow this repetitive motion for long periods of time, especially if you're running on the on pavement. You know, most people have terrible horrid running form and they simply heel strike the ground because because they think that they're more fatigued than they really are. If you're doing cardio for longer than 30 plus minutes, then you should stay in this aerobic zone for the most of the time. This is the zone where your heart rate is below 60 to 70 percent of your VO2 max. At this intensity, you're not using f you're using mostly fat and not glucose as your fuel, which is perfect because you'll be able to use the ketones and fatty acids. Becoming fully keto adapted takes several months or so. You need to really, you know, dig deep into these fat burning pathways and, you know, engrave them into your metabolism to gain the maximum benefits. The general guideline is that the longer you do the ketogenic diet, the easier it gets and the better you start performing. However, using carbohydrates strategically will not only improve your performance, but your health overall. You know, people think like, when you're starting keto, then you, you have to stay below 20 grams net for the entire life. But, you know, there are actually a few reasons why you should occasionally get out of ketosis. Let me explain you why. Some people, they might get hormonal imbalances, like a low thyroid, or low libido or low testosterone because of several reasons. Maybe it'll be like they don't get enough sleep, they don't get enough micronutrients, or they exercise the wrong way. Your energy levels may also suffer from time to time on the keto because, because of overtraining or too much stress in your life. The ketogenic diet also causes low mucus production, which prevents your body from creating enough mucus that surrounds and moisturizes your gut intestinal walls and the mucus around your eyes. So it's a good idea to occasionally incorporate some glucose that will allow to that will allow these processes to take effect. Some carbohydrate foods can also promote a healthy gut and keep your microbiome diverse and healthy. Carbohydrates can also boost your performance while you're working out, but they can also improve your sleep because of serotonin. Eating carbohydrates seasonally like like uh, let's say some starches that start growing on autumn or during the harvest of apples at, at the fall, they will fit better with the circadian rhythms and your own individual genetic blueprint. For instance, if you live in a northern climate, then you don't get access to fruit and carbohydrates year round and your and your genetic blueprint has become accustomed to those types of things because your ancestors they they ate that kind of way and of course it's all it's it's nice to sometimes eat foods that aren't bacon and eggs or vegetables and to you know mix things up to bring in some variation into your diet you know but don't worry the getting kicked out of ketosis it doesn't mean that you're gonna lose your keto adaptation you'll be able to effectively use fat for fuel despite that it's just that you gain some other benefits of metabolic flexibility by incorporating some carbs strategically and like I said you don't need to maintain nutritional ketosis 24 7 to be keto adapted you're not going to get into ketosis by eating keto for just one day of the week and you're not going to lose your fat burning metabolism by getting out of ketosis from time to time either you know the body is trying to maintain homeostasis and it, it doesn't want to go through these random changes all the time it wants to it wants to maintain this inner equilibrium and balance this is the stage where you want to reach with your ketogenic diet the third stage called metabolic flexibility metabolic flexibility refers to successfully being able to use different fuel sources and having a very well functioning microbiome most of the time you would still want to be in ketosis because it's going to maintain your keto adaptation but if you're staying in ketosis all the time and eating only the ketogenic foods then you may leave yourself vulnerable to some of the other foods that aren't keto proof for instance if you've been in ketosis for months on end and then you accidentally eat some gluten or even just you know, a few potatoes then 
you're gonna feel like crap the day afterwards, you're gonna get kicked out of ketosis. Of course, you know, the best solution would be to not eat those carbohydrate foods at all and stay keto for, you know, year round, but it's still going to leave you fragile to these random changes. You don't have room for errors. You know, you would want to be the in this zone where you have the ability to utilize those carbohydrates for increased performance while still maintaining your keto adaptation. This is what Nassim Nicholas Taleb calls anti-fragility. It's about getting better under stressors and in chaotic events. A fragile metabolism will leave you susceptible fatigue, muscle loss and brain fog, which is basically the description of an average sugar burner on a high carbohydrate diet. But you know, the same can happen with a strict ketogenic diet as well. A robust metabolism it wouldn't be that affected by any drastic fluctuations in macronutrient intakes, but it wouldn't benefit from it either. Think of a semi-high carb diet with maybe 200 grams of carbohydrates per day. You're not in ketosis and you're not keto adapted, but you don't feel a significant difference between eating a ton of carbs or fat either. You're, you're this indifferent. An anti-fragile metabolism, it will greatly benefit from whatever fuel source it has access to. You know, both fatty acids and ketones and carbohydrates and glucose. It will also thrive in a state of zero caloric intake. This is where you want to get this anti-fragile metabolism. And how you do that? You do that by increasing your metabolic flexibility. Increasing your metabolic flexibility, it should first start with becoming keto adapted. The foundation to, to any anti-fragile nutrition strategy is, is the ketogenic diet because you need to be able to burn your own fat for fuel. On a high carbohydrate diet, without keto adaptation, you're only capable of burning glucose while not putting ketones into use. But you want to have both for optimal performance. You want to have both the glucose and the ketones. You have to also incorporate both the aerobic and anaerobic training because the purpose of your exercise should be to increase mitochondrial density. The mitochondria are your cells power plants and mitochondrial density refers to your cells ability to generate energy whether that be from ketones or carbohydrates or if you're doing fasting then from your own body fat. You know, to improve your body's ability to burn both these carbs and ketones for fuel, you can do a few simple strategies that I'm going to share with you. First, you can consume a small dose of carbohydrates during your intense workouts. This is the, called the targeted ketogenic diet or TKD. You simply consume maybe 5 to 10 grams of high glycemic carbohydrates with MCT oil and some protein. This is best for exercises like powerlifting, gymnastics, bodybuilding or some some sports activities. Secondly, you can eat slightly more carbohydrates on the days that you train harder. This is called carb backloading where you eat low carb all throughout the day. Then you go to the gym and have a muscle glycogen depleting workout. And then you have dinner with some additional carbohydrates. Let's say like a sweet potato or a little bit of more rice. How many carbohydrates you consume on your carb backloading, it depends on your muscle mass, how hard that you trained, and whether or not you're trying to gain weight or you're trying to burn fat. The third option is called the cyclical ketogenic diet that involves eating keto for the majority of the week and on the weekends you have a day where you eat a lot of carbohydrates. I've tried all of these three options and my favorite one is the targeted ketogenic diet because you, you, you're basically able to utilize the ketones for the majority of the day and you only use those small amounts of carbohydrates like specifically for your workout like for the specific set of exercise that will be immediately used for protein synthesis afterwards but there are also other ways you can improve metabolic flexibility not just for performance enhancing purposes but for also improving your gut diversity you know, your gut is inhabited by billions of bacteria and they all influence your mood, how your body metabolizes certain nutrients and how you feel on a daily basis. That's, that's the reason why some people do better on keto than others. Your, your individual genetic makeup 
actually makes you metabolize fat a lot better. If your heritage is, let's say, equatorial around the equator, then of course you're gonna do better on eating some more carbohydrates because, because you're carrying the DNA of your ancestors that live inside your microbiome, like the hunter-gatherers who would live in the jungle and who would have access to fruit and starchy veg vegetables more often. People in the northern hemisphere, they, they tend to do slightly better on more fat and protein because they're mostly pastoralists or fishermen or hunters who, you know, who would who would store a lot of the meat and uh, fat for the for the winter and they don't have access to vegetables or berries or fruit when the snow is down however the ki uh, i like to think that the ketogenic diet it can work for anyone because when you're in ketosis you're changing your gene expression it's it's epigenetics Epigenetics basically means that certain genes, they get expressed only when you trigger them, when you expose yourself to a certain environment. For maintaining optimal gut health, you will still want to promote gut diversity. What does it mean? What does this gut diversity mean? It means that when you're on keto, you have to make sure that you're getting enough fiber. The average recommended dose or the recommended amount of fiber is about 30 grams per day and if you're doing the ketogenic diet then you may actually be in a situation where you're deliberately not consuming that many fiber because you want to maintain your carbs as low as possible this would be a mistake because it's not worth it to neglect healthy vegetables and leafy greens just so you could stay in ketosis when, when you're doing the ketogenic diet, you should eat a ton of vegetables and salads. It's almost like, it's actually like a plant-based diet. Your salads, they should be massive, like huge bowls with a variety of colors and greens. Like, I, I, I tend to eat like this huge bowl every day. And if you add some sea salt, some pepper, some vinegar, some olive oil, then it's gonna taste amazing and it's just so good and super healthy for your microbiome. Also, you should start definitely eating these fermented foods like sauerkraut, pickles, kimchi and even just the small amounts of raw kefir. There are different types of fermentations you can make like your own tomato onion sauce with some carrots or even some fermented garlic with bell peppers or whatever you may come up with. I also like to in include some apple cider vinegar every day. It doesn't have any direct probiotic properties, but it can still fight the other bad bacteria and viruses that you may inhabit in your gut, like Candida and E. chloride and such, these different bad bacteria. I just drink a few tablespoons of apple cider vinegar mixed in hot lemon water and you're gonna do your intestines a huge favor because it also has a lot of digestive enzymes that are going to improve your digestion. You should also think about using a probiotic supplement and eating prebiotic foods like garlic, onions and asparagus. Another option is to also include some resistant starch into your diet. Resistant starch is a type of starch that, that doesn't get fully broken down or absorbed but it's converted into short-chain fatty acids. Short-chain fatty acids improve blood flow in the colon, they help you to lose weight, they increase nutrient circulation in the body, they inhibit the growth of pathogens and they can also make you sleep better. Foods high in resistant starch include green bananas, beans, legumes and potato starch. You can also cook and cool white potatoes or white rice which will increase the amount of resistant starch in them. You basically, you boil them, you cook them, you, you, you cook them the night before, and then you leave them in the fridge for, for them to be cooled off. And you know, there's nothing detrimental about eating slightly more of these foods. You have to test and experiment to see how your body reacts to different amounts of carbohydrates, to different types of carbohydrates, and to, you know, maintain this metabolic flexibility to keep your body guessing at all times. Consuming some butyric acid will also improve your digestion and gut health. Butyric acid is a saturated short-chain fatty acid 
that's found in butter, ghee, raw milk and other animal fats. This is great for healing cells in the intestines and it's the favorite source of fuel for the cell lining in the colon. It can already happen with your ketogenic diet but you can also, you know, you, you definitely should pay more focus on the fermented foods as well. And of course, now you might think that I'm going to <laughs> I'm going to commit some heresy or you're gonna have to put me in prison, in the ketogenic prison, by if I'm telling you that occasionally eating some gluten, some peanuts, some soy, legumes or dairy is also a, a very viable hack because if you're a healthy individual who, who doesn't have a particular intolerance to these types of allergens but is just choosing to avoid the, them then you should still eat gluten from time to time you don't want to develop allergies just because your gut isn't capable of handling this you know like strict vegans strict paleo people or strict keto people they they may get severe allergic reactions to even just a small exposure to gluten you can avoid all gluten in your food for as long as you would like but you can't completely protect yourself from the gluten that gets floated around in the air particles in in stuff like skin conditioners in hand creams and birthday parties even just standing next to a pastry shop can have some sort of an effect through the air you can inhale some gluten and if you if you haven't been able to if you haven't exposed yourself to gluten for a long time then you may actually start to feel you may, you may get the serious autoimmune condition of some sorts and you definitely going to feel have some sort of a brain fog if you have like an autoimmune condition then of course you don't want to be doing this but if you're a healthy individual then it's a wise idea to incorporate these gluten and legumes and peanuts into your diet from you know every few months or so just so your just that your metabolism could become more flexible and more anti-fragile you should definitely get some tests before you do it to see if you have any preconditions and definitely it's a, it's it involves a lot of experimentation and the overall message with these three stages of the ketogenic diet is that there's the danger of embracing extreme ideologies whether that be following the low carb ketogenic diet or even the high carb vegan diet you know I'm not a doctor and I can't tell you what you should eat because science itself is constantly learning new things about nutrition I myself am finding out new stuff every day and then I try it out, I experiment, I see how my body, how my own unique genetic blueprint reacts to those kinds of foods and then I make my adjustments. I make these adjustments based on my individual conditions and what my goal is with nutrition at any particular moment. I said empty your mind, be formless, shapeless, like water. The ketogenic diet itself has many purposes but you should always remember why you're doing it. You're probably not doing it just for weight loss or to or to just eat bacon. You're doing it to feel healthy, you're doing it to feel amazing and keto is great for that. But you should still follow these stages that I just mentioned here. Be water, my friend. If you disagree with me, then go ahead. You can disagree with me, but I'm not going to be dogmatic about any diet or program. I'm constantly trying to learn new things, I'm constantly trying to try them out and after all, I'm do all and all I'm doing here is I'm sharing my results and I'm giving you the advice that has worked for me. So the overall message with this this live stream has been that you shouldn't be dogmatic about the ketogenic diet or any other diet. And of course, it's a very wise idea to dip in and out of ketosis to maintain your metabolic flexibility. Alright, that's it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed this. If you want to join one of those live streams in the future again, then make sure you like us on Facebook and join my Facebook group. I'll leave the links in the description. Other than that, that's it for me today. Click the like, subscribe, notification bell as well as always. My name is Seem. Stay anti-fragile. Stay empowered.